So hi, my name is Mark Pearson. Um, I'm a professor of architecture here at the College of DuPage. And it is my pleasure to be able to introduce our visiting artist series speaker today, Catherine Darnstadt. I became interested in Catherine's work a few years ago when I came across this really cool project where some designer had taken uh, an abandoned or used CTA, Chicago Transit Authority bus, and turned it into a mobile produce market. And I thought, what a really cool way to address issues of food insecurity in our cities. And of course, the designer behind that project was Catherine. Catherine's work really pushes the boundaries of architecture. Her work as an architect is not merely about creating buildings, but part of a larger dialogue on social and cultural systems. Sometimes referred to as tactical urbanism, her projects actively confront social, economic, and environmental issues beyond the building itself. Her most notable work has become a catalyst for community development and business incubation, using good design as a tool to address larger social and political contexts. Even the name of her studio, Latent Design, suggests that there's a hidden or concealed element in our cities and communities that need to be addressed or should be addressed through architecture. This morning, Catherine spent time with us in the architecture department. We had really the most amazing conversations about the students' design projects and about good design. Um, and so I am thrilled to be able to introduce her to you today so that she can share her thoughts and her work with the entire college community. So please help me welcome Catherine Darstadt. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. Thank you for coming um, and listening to, um, and letting me share this, my story with you and just an alternate way of looking at architecture and seeing the potentials of what the built environment can look like. Um, I know rooms like this are cozy, comfy. I have a great voice, you know? And so if you fall asleep, don't worry about it. I won't get mad at you, but your professor might. Um, so just take that into consideration. Um, so, you know, latent design, as Mark mes mentioned, it's this idea and the definition of latent. How do we take something and make the invisible visible through the tool of design? And where our work has come um, from is this idea that we improve our discipline through emerging practices, the innovators, the ones who aren't afraid to make mistakes and fail and maybe live long enough to do it again. Um, but we move it forward through practices that are bold and naive, bold enough to care and naive enough to dare. Our work exists to explore the influence of architecture as small or as large as the context allows. Most often our work, as Mark described, is thought of as tactical urbanism, um, but I like to think about it as tactical leverage. And so that's really what we're looking at here is the leveraging of design to influence the built environment. And I'll be presenting that as the alternate title that I like to call uh, the presentation, Eight Vignettes of Practice Evolution, presented as a run on sentence. If you haven't already realized, I'm going to talk fast, I'm going to talk long, I'm going to be grammatically incorrect, um, and we're just all going to kind of go along on this ride together. <clears throat> um, and I'm also a little sick, so pauses for coughs. Um, but I can understand why people call our firm tactical. Most of our projects kind of are feral. Um, half of them are neon. And we embrace these indeterminate outcomes of spatial design as part of our value plan, not only the hard line of the architectural plan. Um, the spaces we create are definitely neon, and we look at this as part of a nonlinear history of a nonlinear design process. And this is important, I think, to think of these eight different vignettes um, of kind of what this nonlinear architectural process for myself in latent design has looked like over the past nine, almost 10 years of having the firm. So one degree of architecture, say my name, paved in gold, scope creep, delight, the commons, one-to-one, -one, and architects of. So those are the kind of the subsections of this. And I hopefully will tell you to this in a humorous format that won't undermine this very serious consideration we give to the practice on a daily basis. So one degree of architecture, let's just kick this off. <clears throat> I also like to call this of 
you know, a great way of understanding my background. And for a school like COD, which focuses on transferring you from point A here to another point and another degree, um, I'm coming from a background where I only have a bachelor's degree, right? And we understand kind of the academic situations that our culture has put us in where a bachelor's degree is basically the new GED. And everyone has to go and get their master's to even have the baseline qualifications to get a job. And at my institution that I teach at, I teach at the School of the Art Institute, and I previously taught at Northwestern University, I have very strong opinions on how we're setting our the future of our students up to work in a a workforce that doesn't value the opinions that they're coming out with that one degree of education. And so I talk a lot about um, my background and how I got, he got here, some of the hurdles that came from essentially being academically inferior Right? You, we, we know like how people look at you when you only have an associate's or you only have a bachelor's or you're in that process and showing that we can blaze our own pathways moving forward that way. Um, this is also, um, this is how latent design started. So this is a great way to think about um, how to have a nervous breakdown. So in 2009, so I graduated from IIT, where many of the architecture students might go. Graduated from IIT in 2009, I was in a three month span, these all happened month to month. Um, I was first, I was one month, I was licensed. Then I, naturally the firm I was working with was like, all right, you achieved this milestone, you're licensed, we are going to promote you um, because you are now officially an architect. Um, after that, I got married because I was like, yeah, I achieved everything. We were planning our wedding. I got it all done before the wedding and still fit in this dress. Let's go. Let's get married. Um, that was in December of 2009. In January of 2010, my firm said, oh, did we say we were going to promote you? Misspoke. We're going to lay you off because recession. So I got laid off. I found out I was pregnant. And, and in the, after that is now in a very real situation of a very real life decision of looking at, I've achieved and I gotten to the point where I'm at where I wanted to be professionally and personally things are changing, but now I have to make a decision in a climate that I know is not conducive to anyone getting a job right now, working in an industry that is wildly um, uh, discriminatory towards women and, and pregnant women and people who just want to have families, what am I going to do? How do I push this forward? And then, like, how do I actually pay myself? Now, I have no job. And so the natural thing that I did um, was start my own firm. Be um, and the reason that I did that is I thought in my head very naively that um, I could just, I'm an architect, right? I could go practice architectures. This is what all of our professors said. They all glamorize and say, hey, you just go you just go build that first building and you get it done because you're an architect and you could do it. It's like, all right, I could do it too, so let me go do it. Um, and besides, you know, I'll only do this for a year. I'll make my own maternity leave and then I'll come back because someone will hire me because I'm amazing and, you know, and I'm a good architect and, you know, it'll be fine and I'll look back at this and laugh. Um, obviously, none of that happened or else I wouldn't be here talking to you today. So um, this is how I broke up my savings. I, as one degree, um, since I had only one degree, I didn't go to grad school. I didn't take on any debt in the first three years of work. I was ab able to save up $20,000. So this is how I split that savings, right? Because I had to figure out how am I going to live for the next year and how am I going to take care of somebody for the next year. And so I put $10,000 into dependent one, which was the kid, and $10,000 into setting up dependent Dependent two, which was the architecture firm. And so that's how it looked at that. But this is how it realistically broke down. So at the, um, this is where that $10,000 went. And these are very real costs and differences of what that um, notion of how we think about setting up of being an architect or an artist so you could just go be talented and go do your own thing. And it's not going to cost, talent is free. You could just go do it. But this is what it broke down to. So right, that chunk in the middle is all of our licenses, right, um, where, that we need for our software, our hardware, our insurance. So at the end of the first day, which was my business plan, which was, this is really my business plan, was a post-it note, was I was broke by the end of the first day of just going through getting everything legal that I needed. Because um, I know half of you here are working off of pirated software, and that's OK. Um, but when, you, when we had to go back in and had to actually be a licensed professional, you know, you have to actually pay for that shit. And, you know, that's expensive. Um, creative Adobe doesn't mess around with you, you know? They take you for life. Um, 
but this, <laughs> this was the business plan. So how do I make the thing that makes the things? So very early on, it was a challenge to think about how could I design a system and a building as one part of that system. The other piece is how do I, you know, don't go for broke, don't go broke. Right? Well, that, that first day, I only had 1,500 bucks realistically left to make architecture for a year. So it's like, all right, well, I didn't accomplish that part of the business plan. So what happens when you kind of flip that up and think about, hey, let's go for broke and think about um, you know, this nascent idea of a regenerative architecture and this nascent idea of pushing it as far as you can? Because remember, in my time, this is like a one-year sprint. A one-year sprint of it's just going to be kind of a big prototype. We'll figure it out as we go along, and you know what's the worst that's going to happen? Somebody's just going to say no, right? Um, so let me just go forward with that idea. I was 27. I was an idiot. You know why would I even think this is a good idea? But that's what I went forward with, and that's what I came out with at the end. So that was my salary the first year, straight from the IRS. What my tax returns looked like. So I wanted to be also really real on what that got me. So at least I was able to pay myself back for taking out the savings. But that's what I lived on the first year of my first creative endeavor of running an architecture firm. And I think um, this became very important because, um, you know, we don't talk about that in our profession. And I don't know if all, if all the students with, uh, in the different departments, if that's a conversation of how you're going to support yourself and be real and be creative and think about creative industries and how you support yourself within that. I look at that now in some of our projects and one of them that I will talk about later on today, our biggest clients are creatives. And the reason being is because they're poor. They're not making a lot. Creatives often live just above the poverty line. In Chicago, the average amount that a creative might make, an artist, a musician, even an architect, is like you know around $42,000, $45,000 a year for your first couple years. So how are we, that piece of affordability, not only was I living in it the first year I started the firm, but that became a driver for why I designed the way I do. Because that was a very, uh, there was a moment of reality that just hit me like a ton of bricks. Because this is what I was taught, right? I was taught that an architect is, you know, they work on concept, they work on schematic, they work on design development to construction administration. This is what I was taught, but none of the reality of working in the profession was showing me that at the moment. We're taught, um, that firms are called practice, practices, right? A practice is something you do to get good, not because you already are good. And the thing is, how we set up our models is we are not able to be principals of our own firm until we are principals of someone else's. That's why the average architect is a 52-year-old white male. That's the actual demographics for the entire national industry of architecture of licensed architects. So as a 27-year-old mixed-race female, I am the opposite of that. And so then also looking at how do we change these standards has been also a driving force of why I advocate and why I talk about architecture. And I like to think that instead of being principals for someone else's firm first, we could stand and be principled for something that we believe in, and that's going to start to change the demographics, the um, energies within, um, within architecture. My firm, Leighton Design, it's a prototype. We don't make architect only make architecture. We make the built environment. We make systems. And more importantly, we really think about making future founders. Um, that is something that I embrace being first so someone else can learn from our mistakes and do it better, but hopefully in half the time. And so this project, Say My Name, what I'll get into was really dealing with um, the project that Mark alluded to, Fresh Moves Mobile Market. And how this started is we had a client approach us. This was one of my very first projects in 2010 when I started the firm. We had a client approach us with an insurmountable problem. Right? It wasn't just a problem that they were facing, it was a problem that uh, 600,000 people in Chicago were facing, and that was food insecurity, specifically lack of access to produce where they were living um, in the city, which are called food deserts. Um, and so they approached us with this uh, deep history, deep passion, but they didn't, have, um, they didn't have a name, they didn't have a business card, they didn't have a website, and they didn't have a design. And this was a project that was very much so 100% um, not architecture, but it, it shaped how I think about architecture and 
and the, the possibilities of the extent and the expansion design can be. So what they found in part of their research is they found this really amazing fact that every year cities like Chicago and across the country decommission infrastructure, meaning um, they get rid of it uh, like a, a transit bus. So transit buses have a federally determined lifespan that they can operate and then they have to get decommissioned. But they normally don't go away. They go south, so they go to Mexico or Central America or South America, they go to the prison system, they go to um, scrap. Um, but this one that the that we just saw, the client said, well, we could probably use that as a grocery store, right? Because their model also where we felt kinship was that they had an original model to build more neighborhood small scale grocery stores. So flipping the corner store from selling liquor and cigarettes into selling apples and oranges and flipping that script, um, which we now see more, uh, more common in our cities, but in 2010, we were still dealing with a lot of disparities on what's being sold in our neighborhoods. Um, and so when the recession came, they couldn't build bricks and mortar anymore, so they were in the same boat of rethinking their whole entire um, mission and agenda and how do they deliver the solution that they want they want. So we worked with them to take a bus and turn it into this, and it was a deconstruction of the entire interior of the bus um, to transform it into a produce market, uh, a mobile produce market. And while you know, one of the things that we saw and had to push forward with the design and why a bus even made sense is because they had to make the case to a brick and mortar grocery retailer that their neighborhood was a, a a, an area they should invest in. So you have to speak a different language, right? You're not talking about like, here, we need people because we have 20,000 people here who don't have access to produce. It's really about like, no, we sell 1,000 pounds of produce every day and we have you know, 125 linear feet of produce display and that translate to a store of 20,000 square feet that you could make profitable. They had to change their language of how they sell and show demand for their product that had to almost in a way um, you know, educate educate everyone on how we actually talk about produce because it's not necessarily like produce and food and grocery retail has a different um, development model and not everyone is is used to that um, and so we all had to learn together of what's the way that we talk about this and of course we had to transfer the exterior of a bus how do you get people who uh, to buy produce off a bus. I take public transit and the first time like I would sit on a bus, you know, I know I've been on a bus when someone peed on it and I'm not gonna all of a sudden now turn around and forget that memory and like go buy apples off of it, right? So we had to really flip the script and make it something that's bright, that's juicy, that's somewhere you want to go. And so for us as a team, we looked at this as designing everything but the food. And that's not something we get that opportunity to do in architecture. It's been decades since architects like Alvaro Alto or Frank Lloyd Wright designed everything down to the doorknob and the silverware. And now we get to work with a team of people and a client that's allowing us to work with them to design a whole entire food delivery system. And it even went so far to, to look at, you know, in this photo here, um, we see we see the, the realization of that often used platitude of small, you know, small projects have big impact and you kind of think it's like someone just blowing smoke. Um, this is the actual manifestation of it because at the, not only do we have the, from on the right, we have the founder of the original non-for-profit, we have Mayor Emanuel, we have another uh, community leader, but at the podium, you have at that time was the, the director of the USDA, um, Tom Vilasak, and this project ultimately became not only a local example of what a way to look at produce within our cities, but a nationally funded example of how to look at mobile markets within urban environments. So the USDA then funded the, for the expansion of this idea across multiple communities across the country. And that's where something that's only like 350, 400 square feet trying to tackle an issue of over half a million people and millions of people across the country can actually have an impact. And for us as designers, it was a, a huge eye opener to see like maybe we, you know, we designed just the object, but we really have to think about designing systems. And this, this gave us in the real sense this um, 
it was part of this wave of new architectural typologies called, you know, tactical ur urbanism or placemaking or all these other things, but it was this fundamental shift from thinking of um, the expert, we flipped thinking of experts became amateurs, we didn't know anything about food access and we learned along the way. And the amateurs that we would normally see, which would be the community, right, we'd have a pejorative kind of viewpoint of them, were starting to be seen as the experts. So we all flipped roles in this project and then for us, we flipped into this role of designer and did everything else. We went from strategic planning and grant writing to product design and exhibit installation. You know, what I think was, um, quite interesting about this is that these are all the different ways that our project was thought about, right? You know, as I mentioned, it could be spontaneous intervention, tactical urbanism, placemaking, but why couldn't it just be design? And as this project grew in terms of its reach and people knew about it more, we received a variety of design awards, um, but one in particular stuck out for me because um, we didn't win, we came in second, um, and this was the reason why. So the Core 77 Design Award, if anyone's familiar with that or heard of that, it's an international design competition and we were um, the runner up in the food design category and this is the reason why from one of the jury. So what they said is our, you know, it's a beautiful project, our design is great, but it's too, but it might be too socio-political. So the reason our design wasn't considered the best is because we were too involved with people, with place, with context, with a real world problem. And so that undermined design quality and the, de like the, the, the design with the capital D, it undermined it all because we cared about people. And you're like, holy shit, this is so transparent. Thank you for actually showing me that this is really how the design world can think and how we can have this opportunity and maybe motivate me. Can this quote motivate me and the team and everyone we worked with to maybe keep doing this? Because if you thought that project was socio-political, all the rest of them that came were like, weren't even trying to disguise it. And which is how it brings us to, you know, paved in gold, right? Um, so we think about, you know, good into like the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So instead of paved in gold, it's paved in good intentions. So we have all of these models of how you can practice <coughs> um, and how people often tell and recommend professors, you know, other professionals recommend, like, how do I get in, more involved in my community? How do I design with my community and work with them? They're like, oh, just volunteer, or do something pro bono, or do, do a hackathon, give 1%, give half. All of these are models that are talked about, and we've done them all over the, the last decade. Um, and, you know, there's pros and cons to, to some of them, but truthfully, um, good intentions have many different delivery methods. And we have to look at just integrating them deeply into our firms and social impact and a social process deeply into our firms as part of an everyday design process. Um, and this is the project where I started to see that, where we worked with um, the, the families of Whittier La Casita, we, which is in uh, the Little Village neighborhood in Chicago. We partnered with the Parent Teacher Association that right after, um, this is a photo of them con conducting a 43-day sit-in with the, uh, against, uh, in their field house, which was a building adjacent to their public school, um, their K through eight public school. Um, they were, did a sit-in and were participating in a sit-in because they were stopping the building from being demolished. Um, this is before all the public school closures that Chicago went through. This was a, a, a politically and per overt act by parents to save a building that not only housed the only library the school had, but the after school uh, daycare, the ESL programs at night, the storage of the extra textbooks was the area that kids had the only bathrooms for when they were playing outside on the playground to stop this building from being demolished. And that 43 day sit in, ultimately they r won the right to keep the building, to access the funds that were going to be used to demo the building, and start a process to rebuild and repair the building all through you know, a bunch of amateur parents being able to organize and save their school because they cared about themselves, their neighborhood, and their children. And to be perfectly honest, the building was terrible. It was a terrible building to be in. I mean, roofs shouldn't do that. It shouldn't have a wave in it. This isn't a design feature. Um, it was a, a building that 
at the turn of the century was actually outdoor field house with only an enclosed central core for the bathrooms that over time got filled in. If you're ever in Chicago, you see like the enclosed back porch that someone tries to say like, hey, that's an extra room. You're like, no, that's a porch. Someone just put drywall on there, that's a porch. It's kind of the same thing where they just kind of put siding in between and over time, everyone just kind of started to use it and it was um, the space. And it wasn't really about the design of the space, it was about the program and the heart of the space and that's why it was called La Casita, the little house. And that's what it is, it was the hearth, it was the home, it was the center of this school community. Um, and so we worked with them um, to understand really where, like how do you think about uh, like structural racism in design, how does this community group, which was predominantly Spanish speakers, even understand an engineering report you know, that's given to them? Because the city and public schools would say, here's, here's all the documentation we have, but then you have hundreds of pages of engineering reports in English, and we have a Spanish-speaking community, so our first role as designers wasn't even designing, it was translating. So we could walk through these buildings in multiple languages and talk about what the engineering reports were saying and, and understand how we could start to approach this. And you know, really at that time, I was being on the parent side of this and looking at it through that lens and seeing what was happening, it was a very shocking situation to understand like how active inequities are still taking place. You know, fresh moves, we saw how, you know, inequities might have existed over time and there's not development of grocery stores in certain neighborhoods, but then this one, you're actively in the middle of a conflict in a neighborhood to save a, a school building and seeing how that plays out and still seeing the ramifications of it. And we worked um, really as, started to make this flip between architects and activists and then ultimately, um, you know, we d designed a, a new proposal for a new modular classroom that not only La Casita would use, but then all public schools around Chicago could also use because we were able to pull in architects who were working on um, school structures who could bring their knowledge and understand you know, how much does it cost to do a current inefficient unsustainable modular building, you know, that becomes a modular classroom that sits in your parking lot. Now how can we re take those safe funds and redesign the space? And unfortunately, um, we never got that chance because about um, a year and a half later, uh, the, the building still ended up being demolished in a, in a strange series of events that were borderline illegal. Um, the building ultimately got demolished um, and is now, um, no, it is no longer there. It was, you know, it was that moment um, that we understood that a building may be apolitical, right? This is the house, it's La Casita, it's the hearth, it's the home, but the process of building is not. And there is a subversive cartography of power that overlays our cities which are built on a series of collaborative collusions. And that's the nicest way that I could say of how our built environment comes to be. It is always going to be a series of collaborative collusions. That's how development occurs. That's how you get a permit. That's how you design a building. You make compromises, you make partnerships. You have to just decide how complicit you're going to be in continuing inequities as you move forward as architects, as artists, as designers, and as citizens. And so that's, um, so that's only about six months separated from Fresh Moves grant. So I have a, we have a moment where we have Fresh Moves that's, that's happening, that we're making change at the federal level, but then we can't make change in our own backyard. That's pretty, you know, that, that emotionally grabs at you. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard to be, um, not only to understand not only is there a dichotomy of food in the city, but there's a dichotomy of space and race and place. And the highest value of that site wasn't a 1,200 square foot um, building that the school and students used on a daily basis, but that it was actually a soccer field. And that it was, um, and in the end, that we worked through C three CEOs of Chicago Public Schools, three of them for that project. One of them's in jail right now that we worked with, and we couldn't do anything to save that building. And so it's an understanding in, that I'm a minority in the field that designs for a world where I'm a majority. And that's how our work at Leighton Design became very activist through that project of seeing that lens of, of the world through the eyes of a parent and through the eyes as someone who grew up in that community too. 
And that leads to scope creep. This is how all the other projects came to be and how we do so much more than just architecture now. Um, in 2013, I killed the first version of Latent Design. It was an LLC. And in response, I opened up, uh, I, I dissolved that and opened it as a benefit corporation. And benefit corporation, for those of you who are not familiar, it's an incorporation structure that states you have a dual definition of equity. I look at equity not only through the lens of financial equity and profit, but through the lens of social equity and people. And that's ingrained in our incorporation structure and all of our documents. It's a legal requirement to do good for people and for our society. That's what we signed up for. You know companies that are already doing that, like Patagonia, they care about the environment, right? So their profits go to support the actual, the preservation of actual Patagonia. You know, Kickstarter is the same. It's a benefit corporation. There's a whole host of, of organizations and businesses that have adopted this structure since 2013. Um, and so I looked at it and I became a corporation because apparently since Citizens United people are corporations and corporations could be people, so a little tongue in cheek of like maybe my little firm, we could be a powerhouse corporation too and go after the type of work that we wanna do and the impact we wanna have. Um, because we have a strong social barometer of what's valuable to a project, it's on our mission and on our sleeves. And latent design, um, we look at not only um, what influences our built environment, which is zoning policy and funding, we look at you know, our ethos and our will to create these projects. And so what I also looked at around this time was there is, um, it's ridiculously easy to be a contractor as well. So part of that rebranding of the firm and reorganizing of the firm, we started to look at how, what's happening with our project, what scale of our projects are at, and what's stopping them from being completed. And one of the things that we saw is that um, for our small scale projects, we couldn't get our large scale contractors to get out of bed for them. Like they wouldn't bid something that's under $250,000. They definitely are not bidding something that's $50,000. And they sure as hell are laughing at me if I tell them the budget's 15 or $10,000 and they're not going to build it. They would love it. They might give advice, take me out for a beer and give me some free advice, but they're not gonna build it because there's not any profit. And so we started to think about that as well. If this is becoming a hindrance to getting projects that are of need realized, what if we became contractors? We researched that and found out in the city of Chicago, you don't even have to leave your desk to do that. You just have to fill out a form, sign a check, show, send a copy of your, of your insurance, and two weeks later, a contractor's license shows up. And that explains a whole heck of a lot of the construction in the city, but it also becomes became a vehicle and an opportunity uh, for us to start to then act as not only architects but contractors and design build some of our small projects. Projects like this where we made a, a parklet, a, a, a public space out of a parking lot. Um, those guys are actually uh, my plumbers and we'd use plumbing tubing for it, and they didn't get the joke, but I thought it was funny. But that's the type of people that we were working with, ones who, who are amazing craftspeople, but didn't want to take the liability of being a GC, right? Amazing craftspeople, but didn't want to take on those additional fees. And so we were never sacrificing in craft and quality, but then we could elevate the design opportunities and start to understand how we could even realize projects for incredibly tight budgets. Because we have a situation where there's a huge demand for these types of spaces, for this design, for, for parklets, for public spaces, but it's very hard to also find the team to do it and then to also find the funding to do that because this is paid for through a business or through an SSA or through a chamber, small scale public funds. So we have to look at financial systems to make these projects viable or else we're gonna live in cities that just don't have them. And I just don't, and I, I, we take that on as a challenge of something we want. And so now all of a sudden we're looking at this through the lens of a contractor, right? We know GC, we know subcontractor. Is there a difference between a contractor and a builder in terms of craft and quality? What does this look like when now that we're taking on a new role and a new risk, how does this actually tie in to think about not only what's getting built, but who's building that? And so now do we look at partnering with day laborers, with vocational training programs to teach skills, construction skills to students, young adults, um, or are we even actually working on 
um, finding ways to reintegrate um, formerly incarcerated individuals into the work environment and into the world and understand and show people that maybe your best carpenter might have been a criminal and start to change what that model looks like in communities through some of our projects. And delight. Um, you know, you all know it's Vitruvian, right? It's one of the basic Vitruvian principles, firmness, commodity, and delight. And I, don't, I think sometimes we have to remind ourselves to build delight into our buildings. And instead of just looking at the construction and the financial model, let's also remember that we could build delight into our projects. Um, this is one that we worked out a couple years ago uh, with the artist Theaster Gates. Um, it was his Art House Gary project where we were part of the team to design a new artistic facade for a building, um, for a very nondescript building. Um, and for this challenge, we took on everything from design, from fabrication, construction, installation, um, programming. And what you see is um, our version of a sweatshop, right? So we actually made a facade out of 2,000 plexiglass tubes lined with dichroic film um, and assembled, attached onto a bent uh, steel structure that was powder coated. Um, so you have um, these tubes on the top and bottom of a vertical steel structure. And then over the course of the day, it would the sun would hit the tubes and reflect. It would hit the dichroic film and project different colors, pink, green, blue, depending on where you were. And then at night, because they were capped with solar LEDs, um, it would glow from the interior. And so for that project, it was probably also not completely OSHA compliant because it's art, and we found there's a lot you could get away with art, so there you go. Um, maybe more architects need to practice art and see where those opportunities uh, take you in terms of the design of the built environment. But it also allowed us um, and our team to, to work in a very, at a very different scale where we had to learn how to become craftspeople, and we had to understand our abilities and inabilities to make something happen um, and also find out who's afraid of heights because we spent um, quite a bit of time 35 feet in the air in the middle of Gary. Uh, and so for us, like our role was not only architect of record, it was a, and design team member, it's a Sherpa, it's a fixer, it's a, you know, it's a faker, a maker, it's all of these other things that get a project done. It's the goat herder of a project to make a, an artistic idea and a design come to life. The commons. We know, um, you know this map probably. Um, everyone knows Chicago, right? This is kind of, if you live in the Chicago and design in it, you could draw this map in your sleep, right? Um, and we know the city is rooted in neighborhoods and public spaces of infrastructure. And when neglected or inaccessible, these vacancies, whether strategic or accidental, are detrimental to neighborhood health and vitality. This is a map outlining every public plaza in the city of Chicago. So the dots are the locations, the blue filled in are the neighborhood area, and what we see is we have some, we could see the inequities right there. Why doesn't every neighborhood have a public space? I don't know. You know, that's part of looking at spatial, spatial inequities that we have in the city. Um, we only have 12.2 acres of public plazas in the city of Chicago. For comparison, that's half a Millennium Park for the entire rest of the city of Chicago to use. 33% um, of them are in two wards. Um, so a third of all public spaces are in only two wards. Um, and the budget that the city normally spends for it comes out to about nine cents a square foot. So you could, somebody could reach under their chair right now and find more change than the city is putting towards the uh, public spaces in our neighborhoods right now. You could probably fund it. You could be a philanthropist right now if you found me a quarter. Um, and so we look at this as we, about uh, three years ago, we partnered with the city of Chicago to look at all of the public spaces across the city, look at this problem through a three-year case study, um, and we made proposals for small, medium, large ways of interventions, right? Uh, we looked at the small ways of like, well, look, first and foremost, can these plazas be performance, their public space? Can we start to bring some of the cultural entities deeper into the neighborhoods for public performances? Easy. Let's bring Joffrey Ballet out to Garfield Park and have a performance on a plaza that um, everyone can attend and enjoy. The highest compliment we ever got was during this performance, there's a little bus stop to the left. The, the bus stopped to pick people up and drop people off and then sat there for the whole entire performance. So everyone on the bus 
agreed that they were going to watch a ballet performance for 10 minutes. They opened up the windows, clapped when it's done, and then kept driving off. Highest compliment. You could give me an award and I wouldn't think it was more of a compliment than that bus that day and that group of people who wanted to stop and, and watch ballet at a bus stop. And we look at this as opportunities across all these plazas to think of ways, how do we plan to rebuild them too? Some of these plazas have been vacant for 50 years and as neighborhoods change and grow around them, those vac the, when those sites are vacant, they kind of become wallpaper. You don't even notice them anymore. You don't even know you could use them anymore. And so we start to do interventions and experiential design to start to bring people out. But in this particular case, what this photo is showing is different ways that we could change uh, traffic patterns on a plaza to help understand um, a new design that was being proposed by the community. So starting to, to make those one-to-one -one mock-ups again um, to have conversations, interactions, and moments with people. And because of this, we're in a partnership. We're in a public-private partnership with the city, and that's something where now all of a sudden we are can actively make a say about what's happening with public space, public art, you know, and, and how does that switch our role from an architecture firm that's doing social impact design work to now a corporation that's partnered with the city. Those are very different views of the same firm, and we've been in kind of the middle of that over the last three years of understanding how the public sees that role. And the reason why we did that, um, we did that and we ultimately submitted an RFP for the initial public space design, um, design contract because the city was soliciting um, advertisers. So instead of dance and ballet, you would get advertisements on your public plazas. Instead of getting a mock-up of neon on your plazas, you'd get a billboard. And when we saw that come out, we're like, I don't think that's the way that we want to walk to work every day. We could have a different opportunity. And we submitted essentially a protest proposal for it that we ultimately won. <laughs> and so it was one of those moments where <clears throat> like an old ancient proverb, may you get exactly what you wish for. The last three years have been understanding what that looks like and dive into what a, a corporate partner and public-private partner with an entire city and a municipality really looks like and how we were woefully unprepared to really take that on, but how we've had these moments of success throughout that. One of them being the one-to-one -one model of Boombox. And this was kind of that extra, lar that large-scale intervention that we were able to take a, the public space contract and, and, and insert another problem that we saw in the city that we weren't able to fully find the right avenue to start to realize and have discussions around. So this is an example. This is the very first um, Boombox we built. And, you know, what this was and what this was responding to was a situation where every single client that we had worked with previously was, um, nearly every client was a community-based organization or we were working on a corridor plan. And out of that would come various concerns that would be, how do we support our small businesses? How do we revitalize our neighborhood corridors? What do we do about vacant land in our neighborhood or even across the city? How do we build affordably? And as architects, when we were in the planning role, we were writing all that down and putting that in a format and then giving it back to the client who might sit on their shelf. But as architects, we weren't building affordably and we weren't addressing this issue. And now we're in a role where, okay, well, we're actually a developer and we're a partner with the city. Can we actually use this opportunity to develop that new system? And what we found is when we did the research behind that, um, according to our Chicagoland Chamber of Commerce, about 57% of businesses in 2014 made under half a million dollars in gross revenue. So those are considered micro enterprises. So that's your you know, that's, that's the company that you buy a, a, a necklace from during a craft festival. That's the artist that you see at a, at a gallery opening. That's even at, five, at half a million dollars, that was our firm for many years. A multi-person firm was only, was making under half a million, right? That's a majority of businesses and business owners in your city. In Chicago alone, that's over a half a billion dollar market that wasn't being addressed, not making anything affordably for them at all because the way our commercial retail structure is set up is that you have to, you're too risky, you're too low income, you're not making enough money, you don't have the credit score, you can't sign the three year lease or the five year lease, you know, you're, you're mostly woman owned, you're mostly minority owned businesses, and you're, you just don't fit the model. So we decided to make a new model and that was Boombox. And of course, 
there was no, there was no um, building code for this. This was the first time where we actually had to write a new municipal ordinance to make a 200 square foot micro retail building exist. So let, let's think about that. I would be in meetings with city departments in rooms that were bigger than the building we were proposing to be built. And ultimately in the end, what we saw is the first year that it was up, this is our typical tenant, right? Um, so this is a woman who makes hand block printed scarves in India and Pakistan. Um, and, out of, and she's one of the 23 vendors that went through our space um, in the first year alone. 23 vendors, so that's a vendor every two weeks went through the space. 19 of them were women of color just like myself. And so for us, this is the solution we want. We want to help businesses go from startup to storefront to help revitalize. Uh, vacant storefronts to help build on vacant lots, to help keep our communities together, because many of our vendors and our customers and our clients, they're not interested in going to Shark Tank, right? That's the glamorous model of entrepreneurship, right? You start up, you go on Shark Tank, you make a million, Mark Cuban's your friend and you're successful. And that's not really what business is. Many of our clients just want stability and do what they're passionate about so they could stay in the city that they love and be able to live within it. And what we understood of, about this is that we had to focus on incredibly unsexy things, business licensing, zoning, um, uh, you know, uh, and streamline a variety of policy that for us really made us understand what it takes to make a building, even a small building itself. And then rolling into the contractor portion of this, we built it ourselves. And we actually, this is the second one we built in Inglewood. The first one was in Wicker Park. Um, the second one was in Inglewood. And so what we started is we actually start with a shipping container and we cut out all four sides. And then we um, frame it back up because we have this zigzag facade all the way around on the exterior. So we make our own prefab insulated fireproofed wall structure. We essentially call it a super corrugation, right, to play on the way a container looks. Um, we put um, the framework of the container on the back of a regular old trailer, take it to the site, roll it into place, and then slowly um, then start to add all of the prefab e exterior pieces that you see coming out right here. It's a big IKEA flat pack. You know, that's what this is. And so at the end of the first day on site, not only do you have a building that's completely secured um, and it's ready for all of your rough inspections the next day, but you're minimizing your site time and you're able to, t to turn a building um, into a storefront within five days if the weather's nice and get through all of your inspections. And so now we have 10 of the, we have, we have um, Five, six locations um, of the singular units in Chicago, one of a multi-unit um, market, the first movable market of, in the city of Chicago. So we have that in the West Loop and we're expanding into other cities um, throughout the Midwest and across the country next year. So that model of how do we support our small businesses, arts institutions, individuals has resonated across the city. We made a new modular prototype, right, that we had to ultimately in the end, it was three different pieces of policy we worked worked on to make that real, um, and now we see that it resonates with other neighborhoods, communities, from communities as small as 20,000 people and as large as 10 million. And so this is something that we, we is a, a complete change for us because it was a new role. We became a developer. We understand land use and policy. We figured out finance. Um, we looked at this in through a new lens. We won an innovation award last year. Like how crazy is that, that this little building is considered innovative? And through that lens, we understood, we took on maximum risk in this role. And through that, we got maximum power in that. And we use that to flip it and think about how do we you know, empower people that we want as our clients and our community. And it's kind of wild to think of this journey over almost a decade of latent design where we've been saying the same thing in different roles. We should design equi equitably as architects, okay? P a certain number of people hear you say that and, and listen and give you the, you know, the golf clap, right? You know, okay, as contractors wearing that lens, we should build equitably um, as contractors and think about who we employ at our, at our neighborhoods and the structures that we build. And a, few more people hear you that way. But when we say, hey, we should fund and develop equitable structures within our communities, ah, since we're bringing the money, everyone wants to listen to us now.
people actually return my calls. And what's crazy about the whole entire thing is we're still in all of those roles. We're still the architect, we're still the contractor, but our respect level has absolutely changed when we take on this role of literally building our communities, our neighborhoods. And that's something that when we think about the future and the systems of architecture, that's where it takes on a whole different role for us. And so for architects of, this is really what I'm excited about for the future of architecture. Um, you know, these are a series of small projects, but they have been influential until how we structured the firm. So again, going back to that platitude of like small actions have big impact, this is how much it changed the firm. Um, itself. And over a course of almost any project that now comes to the, the firm, we could take on a variety of these roles. Sometimes we're only architects. We're working on a project with the Mayo Clinic. We're only architects for that one. Sometimes we're designers. We're working on a project with University of Chicago where we're looking at um, sustainability guidelines. We're only a designer in that role and a, and a researcher. You know, activist, contractor, fixer, corporation, developer, some, all, none might be on a project. And that's the fluidity of, of the firm model that we've grown over time um, and the future of what I think architecture could be because we have to change our ability to have influence over the built environment, not only through like just trying to push through a design idea, but trying to understand and make new design systems. And to work this way is a very risky endeavor where fear and failure are not an option, but they're part of the process. And it's, it's an understanding of not only mental and emotional risk, but true legal risk that change how our firm works and how these projects happen. And with that true risk, I think, came um, new responsibilities, but incredible opportunities when we didn't see the boundaries and barriers as actual obstacles, but actually opportunities instead. And that became, um, for us, the way that we, we expand and look at the influence of architecture as large or as small as the context allows, and that's the journey of small projects having larger impacts and the journey of just one type of architecture firm. And I do that because um, I'm not only an architect in um, Chicago, but I'm also a citizen in Chicago. And I feel we have two opportunities every time we design, once as designer and another as citizen, to say and to make a choice on what these spaces are going to be. And we have to do that. And we have to remember we have that opportunity because spaces are as profound as we want them to be. And so it's not just tactical urbanism, it is really tactical leverage to make the cities the way that we want them to be. Thank you. You talked about failure being part of the process a few times. Can yeah. you touch on a few of like your greatest failures that, that ended up being your biggest teachers? Yeah, um, actually, um, Boombox was one of them. So the first time we pitched it, because um, it was a year process to get through all the policy, all the city contracts, documents, all of those things. The first time we talked about it, we talked about it in like the big picture. We're like, hey, there's a structure. It's going to be able to reclaim vacant land and help small businesses. And we could replicate it 100 times. And we could build it all with Chicago. We could partner with a vocational program. We told them everything, like everything that we wanted this thing to do, all the dreams and hopes. And it was way too much. People would, different departments would be like, oh, wait, you're using a shipping container? That's a no. We don't know how to do that. Oh, wait, you're doing micro retail? That's too small. Minimum building size. That's a no. Oh, you're putting small businesses in it and you want to do like true pop-up retail? We don't have a light, we don't have an ordinance for that. You can't do that. So it was like, it was depressing. Like it's, a, it's an idea, it's right there. And what it took was an understanding of truthfully knowing your audience who you're talking to and parsing out that story over a series of conversations. Whereas now, I could talk freely about, it's actually doing that. It's actually taking businesses from startup to storefront. We have nine businesses that have opened up storefronts. We've designed probably five of their storefronts. So it's something we could see businesses grow and expand. It actually is taking over vacant lots. So we're making this thread between city-owned vacant land, city pools of funding, small development projects, and tying that all together to make that yeah, economic development system. So now we're doing that, and now we could talk about it in the holistic sense of it. But at the beginning, like that first introduction, it was like a first date with the city. You don't just like lay out all your skeletons, you know? Um, and so for us, it was like we couldn't lay it, we shouldn't have 
have laid out how we really thought about the entire project, but knowing the audience and making these very kind of laser focused um, conversations and showing like for your department, it's going to do this. And for your department, it's going to do this instead of thinking about it as a whole system. Because the truth is, our trip up is we thought the city talked more and the innovation department in the city talked more to other departments than it really did. It was so, it was, we knew it was bureaucratic. We had hopes that it might be a little bit more, but we figured it out. So we kind of Trojan horsed it is the best way that I talk about it. It's like, just here, it's a little gift. That's all. <laughs> What's the uh, makeup of your like design team? I, I, it doesn't seem like everyone there can be an architect or something like so. How, what type of energies or, or disciplines did you bring together to form yeah. latent design? Yeah, so it's three unique firms now under the Leighton Design Corporation umbrella. So you have the architecture firm, the construction firm, and then the development company that Boombox is focused around, right? So three different legal entities overall in the day-to-day. -day. Um, we have architects in the Leighton Design side. We have architects. Sometimes we have landscape or urban planners, depending on the project. Uh, contractors on the construction side, we work almost on 100% sub-model, um, but I am looking to hire a project manager because a lot of work has come in through that and we're building more of our projects than some of the larger scale ones. And then on Boombox, it's really just the micro retail piece. So that one we will, Boombox will then hire out latent design to build, I mean to design, and then also to build that particular project. So that's kind of more in the developer or also consultant role to other cities because um, cities have reached out to us and other municipalities like we saw what you did in Chicago how could we structure this for our city or de other developers have reached out like how do we do this for a piece of land that we have in Brooklyn or something like that so that's how they work it's still pretty small I mean on any given day there might be four people in the office um, three today because I'm here for half of the day um, and it's a, a lot of it because it's it's single owner, I'm the owner of all of them, right? So ultimately a lot of that responsibility comes obviously on me, but then there's um, efficiencies with um, being able to triage between all of that. Yeah, but it's still a small firm model. We don't employ a lot of people overall. It ebbs and it has highs and lows depending on what's happening um, on projects. I mean, we're hitting low construction season and installation season, so we have no more active building projects right now. But I mean, over the summer, I mean, for a while, it might have been, you know, 18 people that were working, you know, on the construction side on projects and a couple more architects over the summer. And then it would, it would be one other person on the boombox side working on the marketing. So we could expand and flex as needed. Referenced um, degrees and yeah. academic structure in the beginning. If you were to go back, or if you were, or what you're doing now at the Art Institute, how, how would you change your education? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, we talked a little bit about it over lunch. One of the things that I, I don't think I would change necessarily the education. I came out of IIT in the BARC program, so it was like very much more laser focused on materials and technology and, and the practice um, with um, a sufficient amount of design. I mean, I had great professors that are there that are, some of them have left to teach at like SAIC or other design focused institutions. Um, um, and I really enjoyed going there. I think what I would have changed is an understanding of how I should have worked. Um, I think, what, and what I mean by that is I, I think I, I, my advice to my students, I tell them you, to understand the built environment. You should work for an architect, you should work for a developer, you should work for a contractor, you should work for the city and understand all the points of entry of how a building gets built and how land becomes flat into 3D. You know, and I, I kind of wish I did that too and took that model. Um, I also wish I did some of the organization structure that I have at the firm now of, of pushing design build and working on more design build projects earlier in the firm. I, was, I wasn't confident enough to think I, we had that skill or I personally had that skill or, you know, it was, it, it, it took a while to get to there, but I wish I did that earlier. Um, and the other thing is that, you know, from an education model, um, I really think we have to th think about what we're teaching undergrads and associates so that they can go out and work in this field because I don't think it's moving into um, a design and architecture climate that actually needs architects 
as li doesn't need necessarily licensed architects to do the design. We're a branded environment, we're an idea environment, we're an environment where most of the design is coming to you from the branded realm before an architect even has an opportunity to do that. So we already have um, a class divide in architecture with star architects and you know, architects of record. You know, the star architects who get to design and like the administrative architects who just get it permitted. And I think that will increase. And we have this already in an environment where, you know, Apple has architects, you know, um, you know, uh, WeWork has architects. They're designing their spaces before they ever hit a firm. And the reason that they're doing that is because they want to extend their brand that we see as digital into analog. And so why wouldn't they be the gatekeepers of that? So when I look at the future, I see peers who are getting their firms are getting bought by larger corporations. And that's how design of space is going to come together. Um, we have whole, I mean, you think about the future of even living, of co-living, micro-living, all of that. You're going to live in a dorm room until you pay off your student debt. Like, that's just your new living environment that we're, that we're making. But developers are the ones who are hiring, who are making those living models, are hiring architects in-house. So what is, and, and you get better benefit, you get a ping pong table and like an extra $30,000 a year. Like that's a way better deal than working in an architecture firm and you get to realize your architecture faster and your design faster. So that's where I think we all have to like understand that actual trend we're living in now and understand how we teach design and architecture to respond to that, to understand that and to lead that. Because if we don't, if we walk out of here and we don't know how to 3D map a building and don't know how to use that technology and don't understand the manufacturing process that goes behind um, making a steel stud, WeWork makes their own steel studs because they build so much. They are un they're looking at manufacturing. If we don't understand that process, then we why why would anyone need us? We're dinosaurs. We just want to draw some things on paper. You know, they're at, they're at a different scale. And that's the world we have to come out, understand, and own.